Okay, so we're going to go through this circuit and figure out the voltage and current at each point. Before we do that, the first thing that the circuit is asking for is the total resistance here. So, so how do we go about finding the total resistance? We have to simplify this circuit, right? So we have to look for resistors that are either in series or in parallel, and then find the equivalent resistances of those existing resistors. So do you see any resistors that are in series or in parallel here? Which ones? Yeah, the, the 2 kilo ohm and the 10 kilo ohm, right? Those are in, in parallel. Yeah. So we can simplify those. Um, now, what formula do we have to use when we do that simplification? 1 over 1 over resistor 1 plus 1 over resistor 2. That's exactly right. So 1 over the total resistance equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, right? Or the equivalent form that you, you mentioned. So in this case, R1 is 2K. So remember, I convert to raw units before I do the calculations. So I convert that to ohms. So 1 over 2,000 ohms plus 1 over 10,000 ohms. So what does R total come out to be? Somebody have a calculator? 1.67 kilo ohms. Okay. 1.67 kilo ohms. And there was sort of a, a um, gut check that we could use with this, right? We said that when you have two resistors in parallel, that means that there's two paths for the electricity to go down. So it's going to be easier for the electricity to flow down two paths than it would for it to flow down any single path. So when you have two resistors in parallel, the total resistance always is less than the smallest existing resistor. Right? Here, the smallest resistor was 2 kilo ohms. So we know that the total resistance, equivalent resistance, should be less than that. And it comes out to be 1.67. So that passes our gut check, right? Seems like we're on the right path there. So up here, we can write that. We could say R total equals 1.67 kilo ohms. Yeah? That's just the equivalent resistance. Oh, you're right. You're right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. All right. So that's the equivalent resistance of these two resistors in parallel. Um, so what we can do is we can draw an equivalent circuit. So we can say we we still have a 12 volt supply over here. The top and bottom resistors haven't changed. So we still have one kilo ohm up there. And we have five kilo ohms down here. And now we have a resistor over here, which has the equivalent resistance of 1.67 kilo ohms, right? Now, can we simplify this circuit any further? Yeah. What can we do? Is that in series? That's right. They're all in series, so we can just add them up. Exactly. So the equivalent resistance for these three in series is just a single resistor. And if we add them all together, we get 1 plus 5 is 6, plus 1.67. That's 7.67. Kilo ohms there. All right? So that would be our total equivalent resistance. Any questions about that? Okay.
So we can come back over here and we can say that our total is 7.67 kilo ohms. Now, we can write down our V total right away, right? How do we know what V total is? It's, it's 12 volts, right? It's just the voltage which is being applied by our power supply. So we can write that down. 12 volts. Now, can we find I total? Yeah, how would we do that? Ohm's law. Ohm's law, that's exactly right. So we know that Ohm's law is written like this, V, I, R. We're trying to find I. So we come over here and we cover that up. We say I is V over R. So that is 12 volts over 7.67 kilo ohms. So what does our total current come out to be? 1.6 milliamps. Okay. Yeah, 1.57, 1.6. 1. 1.6. 1. 1. Well, yeah, we'll go with a few extra decimals there. 1.57 milliamps. Okay. Okay. Cool. So we know our total current. That's going to be the current coming out of our power supply. So how much current is going to be coming back into our power supply? Same, same, same. same thing. Yeah, exactly. The amount leaving is always the same as the amount coming back. Okay, so we know that. Now, are there any other currents that we can write down right now? Uh, well, I haven't labeled the resistors yet, so uh, that makes it a little harder to identify, but we'll call this one one, uh, two, three, and four. So, um, can we write down any other currents right now? No? Yeah, what, what about this one up here, R1, like you said? I heard somebody mention that. Yeah, exactly. We know that the current coming out of here doesn't have any branches. It, it, only has one path that it can take before it gets to R1. So all of the current that comes out of our power supply has to go into R1. It has no other place that it could go. So if we know the current coming out of there, we know the current for R1 also. Is there another one that we could say? R2. Yeah, this one down here, which is R2. Yeah, R2. So that's one point five seven milliamps as well. Okay? Because what's that? That's right, that's right, exactly. Um, the current coming out of R2 only has one path before it gets back into the power supply. But like you mentioned, there are two paths where the current can go. Um, for R3 and R4, and we don't know exactly how much goes on each side, so we cannot write those down yet. But we've gotten the current for R1 and the current for R2, so that's, that's pretty good. That's a good place to start. So what could we calculate next, do you think? Well, we know the parallel is the same, so it's going to be 12 volts by the equivalence of those two resistors. Almost. So, yes, the voltage on these two resistors is going to be the same, 
but it's not going to be 12 volts, right? We have 12 volts across the entire circuit. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we have, but we lose some voltage here and some voltage there, so there's a little bit less when we get over there. So, so that would be the volts. Yeah. But you lose this and you're bad in volts. Yeah, so we should probably calculate how much we, yeah. we lose. Yeah, exactly. So we know the current through R1, and we know the resistance. So can we figure out the voltage there? Yes. yes. Seven, yeah. 7.6 volts of the drop of R1. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And we know that because, um, well, we, we know that the voltage is... I times R, so so it wouldn't it wouldn't be seven volts. It would be um, I in this case is one point five seven milliamps, or if we're going to do that in current in in raw units. Be point zero zero one five seven amps times our resistance, which is uh, one thousand ohms, right? So what does that come out to be? Yeah, 1.57 volts. Yeah. So the voltage here is the voltage for uh, R1. So that's 1.57 volts. And then we could do a similar calculation at the bottom. So we still have 1.57 amps down there, but now the resistance is 5,000 ohms. So what does the voltage come out to be across this resistor? 7.85 volts, 7.85. Cool, 7.85 volts. OK, perfect. So that's uh, R2 there. Okay. All right. So now we know the current and the resist and the resistance and the voltage for this resistor, as well as this resistor down there. Um, so, so now, like you were saying. Um, we know that the voltage across these two resistors is going to be the same because they are in parallel. So we can figure out what that voltage is, right? We're starting with 12 volts, and we lose 1.57 volts up here and 7.85 volts down there. So the voltage here is whatever is left over. So this voltage would be... 12 minus 1.57 minus 7.85. So what does that come out to be? 2.58 volts. OK. So that's the voltage for R4. And what about the voltage for R3? What is that? It's the same. Same thing, exactly. 2.58 volts. Okay? Because the, the resistors are in parallel, and the voltages are the same for elements that are in parallel. So then the last things that we have to calculate are the current through R3 and the current through R4. So <clears throat> how can we find those currents? Ohm's law. Ohm's law, exactly. So we say, we come over here and we say I equals, and we cover that up, you see it's V over R. So that is, uh, for R3, voltage is 2.58, yeah? Volts over um, 
or three two K. Two thousand ohms. So what does that come out to be? Zero zero one and then are there more decimals? Two nine. Two nine, thank you. Two nine amps. So we could also write that as 1.29 milliamps. And then finally for the last one, it's a similar calculation except instead of 2,000 ohms, we have 10,000 ohms down there. And so the total current for R4 comes out to be what? Should be 0 0.258 uh, microamps. Yeah, perfect. Or 0.258 milliamps. Yeah. So, any questions about how we did this calculation? Um, this calculation, this type of circuit, is the circuit that you're going to be building for your midterm. Okay, and the midterm is going to be entirely hands-on, all right? You will not be required to do any calculations. You will be able to do everything you need to do by building the circuit and doing the measurements. That being said, it's a very good idea to know how to do the calculations and to do them on the midterm to check your work, okay? This gives you peace of mind. If you do the calculations and you get values that match up with the measurements you've made, you know you're doing well, right? If your calculations say one thing and your measurements tell you something else, you know it's probably time to go back and check your work, right? So even though you won't be required to do the calculations, it's, it's very helpful if you know how to do them. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about this right now. I will not be able to answer any questions about doing calculations or, or anything like that on the day of the midterm, which will be uh, next class period on Wednesday. So uh, if you have any questions at all, now is the time. So anything? Okay, cool. All right, <clears throat> so that was a brief review of this circuit. Um, so let's do a quick overview of the midterm, how it's going to go and, and what's going to be on it. Everybody should have a handout that talks about the midterm, that's practice. If you don't have one, they are on the table right here. You can come and grab one. So, so the, the brief overview of what you're going to do for the midterm is that you're going to get some resistors, you're going to measure the values of those resistors, write them down, write down the band colors that should be on those resistors, and then build a circuit with those resistors, just like the circuit that we just went through. Um, you will then measure the total, basically measure all of the quantities that were just up on the board there and write them down. And then you will, um, you'll actually list out a couple of pieces of equipment and that you have used to do your experiments, okay? So that's the brief overview. So let's talk about a few more details. Um, let's just kind of start at the top here of the hand out and work our way down. So the first thing that it talks about is your name. You've got to put that down. I've seen some people forget. Uh, and then after that, you want to record the bag number that is provided. So what we're going to do is everybody is going to get a bag that includes four resistors in it. And that bag will have a number on it. And it's important that you write that number down. What happens is that we have a list of all of the bags and which resistors are in each bag. And so we check our list when we're going through and grading the tests to make sure that you 
did the measurements properly and you got the correct values. Okay? So if you don't write down the number, we don't know which bag you got and we can't check your work. So it's important to write down the, the bag number. You're going to set the power supply to 12 volts and then you're going to use the DMM to measure the recorded voltage, right? Yeah. Are uh, we doing it as lab partners or individuals? Or? Individually. Everybody's going to get their own uh, kit. Everybody's going to work by themselves. There are too many of you to fit every one person to a bench in our normal lab room, so we're going to overflow into the room next door. So some people will be in the room where we, we usually sit. Some people will be in the room next door. Both rooms have the same equipment, um, so you should be able to do it just fine no matter where you are. You'll just decide among you and your lab partner who's going to be where, okay? Um, so you're going to set the power supply to 12 volts, and then you're going to use the DMM to measure and record the voltage. So you're just going to hook the DMM straight to the power supply and read whatever value you see. Um, now, it says set it to 12 volts, but I want you to actually record the measurement that you see. So it's probably not going to be 12.000, you know, it'll probably be 11.97 or, you know, 12.02 or whatever it is, you know, somewhere in there. Just write down whatever the actual value is that you get, okay? And then the next line says use a DMM to measure the value of each resistor determine the three band colors. Well, you might think this is pretty easy, right? You just look at the colors and write down what you see. Well, we're not that slow, okay? We, we did think of that. Um, we give you resistors that have little plastic sleeves around the colored bands, okay? So they cover up the colored bands so that you can't see the colors. Um, so instead, the, the resistor sleeves will have little markings on them. It'll be like a one, or a two, or a three, or a four, or something like that, right? So these markings correspond to the resistor number. So when you're working with the little resistor that has the single marking on it, that'll be R1. And when you measure the value for that, you'll put it down in the spot for R1, and so on. Those little two marks are for R2, and so on, all right? Um, it's important, again, that you, you put the measurement for R1 in the spot for R1, because our list has them, um, has them separated that way. And also, when you build the circuit, it's important that you take the little resistor with the one single mark and put that in the spot for R1, okay? Um, because if you, you guys know that if you take the same resistors and mix them around and put them in different places in the circuit, you get very different total resistances, total currents, all that stuff. So it's important that you, you put the correct resistor in the correct spot on the chart. And you'll notice that the resistors here are not numbered exactly the way that I numbered them on the board today. Um, the R1 and R2 are on the right-hand side, R3 and R4 are on the top and bottom. Make sure that when you build a circuit, you build it according to the diagram on your page. Okay, that's the one that you should use. Um, we, we check our work against that diagram. So make sure that you do that. Um, so, okay, so let's go back to talking about the resistors themselves. It says that you're supposed to measure the resistor value and then find the band colors that would be used to mark that resistor. Okay. So let's go through the process of how we do that. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to measure the value of the resistor. And what we want to end up with are the colors for that resistor, okay? So, say that you measured a resistor and the value was something like um, 1,000, um, 51 ohms, okay? Something like that. 
we want to find what, what colors we would use to, to mark that down. So first of all, let's talk about the value. If you connect your resistor to your multimeter and you see 1,051 ohms on the screen, that's what you should write down. Okay, write down exactly what you see on the screen. Um, it, you should not round it, you should not change it, you should not do anything to it at this point. Yeah? So based on what this, this uh, we don't have to worry about the tolerance band, do we? That's right. You, you, we're going to ignore the tolerance band. We're, so when you, when you measure the resistor, you just write down exactly what you see on the screen. Okay, so that's the first step. And we want to get to the colors. But in order to get to the colors, I do a couple of intermediate steps in order to help me keep things straight in my mind. All right? You guys are not required to do this. If you can just you know, sort of leap ahead uh, somehow, then that would be OK. But this is what I recommend. This is how I keep things straight. And I think that this um, helps other people as well. So, what I do is I find two intermediate steps. So the, the first intermediate step that I do is the rounded um, value. So what I mean by that is that you know that with color bands, what you need to do is you need to, the, the color bands indicate the first two digits of your resistor value, right? So we need to round this value in order to preserve only the first two digits um, that we would have. So what we do is we look at the, the third digit, and then we decide whether to round the second digit up or down, OK? Um, if the third digit is 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, we, we keep the second digit the same. If the third digit is 5 to 9, then we round up. So in this case, the digit is 5, so we're going to round up. So the rounded value here would become 1, 1, and then the, the rest of the numbers become zeros. So this would become 1, 1, 0, 0. So that would be our rounded value. Any questions about that? Okay, so the next step that I use is where I figure out the color numbers. These are the numbers that I'm going to um, write down when I, or these are the numbers that I'm eventually going to change into colors, okay? So the first two color numbers are the first two digits, so that would be 1, 1, and then the third color number is the number of zeros, right? So this would be a 2. So we've got 1, 1, 2. These are the colors that I'm going to indicate. So the color for 1, the color for 1, and the color for 2, right? And then finally, I translate those color numbers back into actual colors. Okay, so what is the color for one? Brown. Brown, perfect. And then we have another one, so another brown. And red. Perfect. So that's how we go from a number that we actually measured on our DMM to the colors that we would um, indicate on our resistor, OK? Let me do one more of these, just as an example. Okay? So let's say we were at 7,819. Um, Ohms. Okay. So, what would my rounded value be here? Seven thousand eight hundred. Yeah. Seven thousand 
800, right? I look at my third digit, and that's a 1, and so I round down. I just keep the first two digits the same. I don't round up, right? So then my uh, color numbers here, yeah, the first digit is 7, the next one is 8, and then I have two zeros. So 2 again. So then my actual colors, what would be the color for 7? Violet. Violet, perfect. In uh, gray. Gray. And red. Okay. There you go. So that's how you do it. Any questions about that? Okay. So you'll notice that we never talked about, you know, desired resistor values or anything like that. Um, we didn't talk about the tolerance bands. You don't have to worry about anything like that. Um, no preferred resistors. It's just you you write down exactly what you see on the screen of the meter, and then you translate that into the, the colors that correspond to those values. Yeah? So anything in the third place around down if it's under five, if it's over five, around up. Right, exactly. You look at the third place, and then if it's five or above, you, you round the second place up. If the third place is zero, one, two, three, or four, you just leave the first two digits alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happens if you don't get the value there? Like uh, what do you mean the value? Like, like if you measure the resistor, like you said, they have a bag and they have a chart. Right. What right. happens if your value does not match the bag? So, so you are not going to see the, the chart on the back, right? You are just going to, we, we have the chart. We use that for grading your tests afterwards. Um, if you measure a value that is different from what we have, then you will, um, well, we'll check it, but um, if, it's, if it's really that you measured one value and we measured a different value, um, you will lose points for that measurement. Okay? Um, so, other questions? Okay. All right, so that's how you measure your resistor values and translate them into band colors. That's the first part of your test. Um, so we talked about resistor measurements here. We did the circuit calculations during our, our review, so I'm not gonna go through those again. But now let's go into building the actual circuit, okay? Um, it's important that you do the resistor measurements first before you build the circuit. This is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, it's important because you always want to do resistor measurements outside of a circuit. You know that when resistors are in a circuit and you try to measure that a resistance in a circuit, that resistance measurement can be affected by other components in that circuit. It could be affected by the power supply if that were turned on. It could also be affected by other resistors that are in parallel with it. So it's always important to make resistor measurements outside of the circuit itself. The other reason that it's important to do this first is because um, our resistors are used over and over again by lots of different students, and sometimes they can get broken. And what makes it even trickier is that sometimes that break happens inside of that little plastic uh, sheath. So it's not always apparent. Sometimes the, the leg is still stuck to the, the rest of the resistor, so it looks okay, but there's a break inside, and so there's no electrical connection. All right? So if you make your resistor measurements first, and you find that one of your resistors has infinite resistance, then that's a bad sign, right? It probably means it's broken. But if you've done it right at the start of the test, it's no problem. You just call somebody over, we'll get you a new bag, and you can go forward, all right? 
If you do all the other parts, and you build your whole circuit, and you do all your measurements, and you, you get everything written down, and then you wait till the very end to do your resistance measurements, well, that's a whole lot of wasted time for you before you find out that something was wrong, right? So, um, so it's really important to do the resistor measurements up front, all right? After you've done that, you can go on and build the circuit. So let's talk about that. While we're waiting for the display to come up, I want to stress the importance of using units, okay? Um, I think I talked about this at the beginning of class, we, we, or at the beginning of the semester, we discussed why it's so important to use units. Remember we said, we talked about the story, imagine that you were at your friend's house and you asked how far it is to the grocery store and your friend says, well, it's five. Five blocks, five miles, five inches, five minutes in the car, right? You, if they don't tell you what units you're using, then the number itself is meaningless. Um, so in real world applications, it's very important to write down the units. So I am going to be checking for the units on this test as well. Um, not because I'm just trying to find ways to knock points off, but because it is truly important uh, to under for you guys to do when you're out in the real world. If you don't do it, nobody will understand your calculations. So if you um, put down the correct number, but you put the wrong units, say, say you meant to say, you know, five kilo ohms, and you put down five ohms, I will deduct probably half credit for that. Um, if you leave off the units entirely, I'll, I'll deduct points for that as well. Um, so it's really important that you guys um, write down the units so that I know what you're talking about, okay? All right, so, so let's talk about how to actually construct this circuit. There are many ways that you could build the circuit. There are many ways to get the right answer here. And you are welcome to do any of them that work for you, as long as you, you make the connections that are shown in the diagram here. That being said, it's often easy to confuse yourself if you start putting the parts you know, just in, in random places on your board. So what I'm going to show you is the way that I like to build this. And I like to build it so that the parts are in approximately the same location that is shown on the diagram. That way, I know that if I'm looking at the resistor on the top of my board, then that's uh, R3 up here, because it's in the top of my diagram. If I'm looking at the one on the bottom, it's R4, and so on. So I can keep things straight in my head, and I don't get confused, right? Even if you are very level-headed and, and you, you have an amazing memory. It's easy to get a little bit stressed out on the day of the test, and that can make things you know, harder to remember. It can, make, um, it, it can make it easier to slip up. So, so I always like to try to keep things the way that they're shown on the diagram. So I'll show you one way to make the circuit, and uh, you're welcome to do that, or you're welcome to do it any other way that you like. All right. So the first thing that I do is I attach the power supply. So the power supply is 12 volts, and it shows the power supply going to the top and the bottom of the circuit. So I'm going to attach the power supply to the top and the bottom of my board. Okay. I'm putting the wires into these, the, this hole on the top of the board, and that hole is connected to every other hole along this long line at the top of the board. So that gives me a lot of places where I can connect to that voltage. And then I'm attaching this other wire to the bottom of my board, and again, it's connected to all these holes along the bottom of my board, so I have a lot of different places where I can connect there as well. Okay. So that's 
the, the first thing that I'm going to do. Next, I'm going to attach R3. So in your case, you would look at the resistor that was actually marked with the three little dots, and that would be R3. And I'm going to put one end of the resistor into the, the top row of my board here, so it's connected to the power. And then I'm going to put the other end of the resistor uh, just anywhere in the board. I'll do R4 next. So that's going to be a similar sort of thing at the bottom of my board. I'll put one leg of the resistor in the hole that's connected to the ground and then the other leg of my resistor into my board there. Now I have to connect R2 between R3 and R4. Right? So I can do that. I'm going to put one leg of this resistor in the, the same row as R3 and then the other leg of the resistor in the same row as R4. Okay, so I've connected those parts together. Now the only thing that is left is R1. Okay. To connect R1, I'm going to use two more jumper wires. So I'm going to put one jumper wire in this same row as R2 and R3, and then I'll put the other end over here. I'll put another jumper wire in this same row as R2 and R4, and I'll put the other end over here. And then finally, I will take R1 and attach it between the two ends of my two jumper wires. So I'll put it in there like that. And that is the complete circuit. Okay? You'll notice that the components are laid out in approximately the same place as they are on the circuit. And uh, so everything it's easy to keep track of it that way. Any questions about how I built that? Okay, so then let's talk for a few minutes about how we can make the measurements that we need to make once the circuit is constructed. Okay? So you're going to be using your digital multimeter to make these measurements. The first thing that you want to measure is R total. Okay? So the way that you can measure R total is you can connect your multimeter to one, one side of the meter to one of these uh, jumper wires, and the other side the other jumper wire. That's going to measure the total resistance of your circuit. This is before your circuit is actually connected to the power supply. Okay? Remember, you never make resistor measurements um, when the power supply is hooked up. So when the circuit is built, but before it's connected to the power supply, you would hook up your meter just like this and put it in resistance measurement mode, and that would give you the total resistance of your entire circuit. Okay? That's the total power and that's the power Before you connect the DC power supply, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be the total, the, the total resistance measure here, okay? The total, let's talk about measuring voltage now, okay? I always think that voltage is the easier measurement to make. Is that because it's a destructive measurement or a non-destructive measurement? Non-destructive, non exactly. It's easier because you don't have to take the circuit apart, right? 
So if you wanted to measure the voltage across R4 here, for example, you would just put the meter in voltage measuring mode, you would connect it to the power supply, and then you would touch the ends of your meter to the two sides of your resistor. And that would give you the voltage measurement for that resistor. Okay? You can do that for any resistor, right? So you just have to touch your circuit across the resistor that you are interested in, and the measurement shows up right on your screen. Not too bad, right? Okay, so that's voltage measurements. The current measurements are a little bit trickier, right? Current is a destructive measurement because you have to partially deconstruct the circuit in order to do it. So you have to do that because you need to put the meter in series with your circuit. Again, there are many ways to do this, but I'll show you the way that I find is uh, easiest and causes the least amount of confusion. So what I do is I take one of my leads from my meter and I grab onto the end of a jumper wire. Okay? The other lead is not connected to a jumper wire or anything like that. Now, if I want to measure the current through R4, for example, what I do is I pull out one end of R4, so it's not connected to the circuit anymore. I take my jumper wire on my meter and I plug it into the hole where R4 just came from. Then I take the other end of my meter and I grab a hold of the leg of R4. What I've done is I've put the meter in series with this resistor. Okay? Any current that's coming out of this resistor now has to flow down this wire into the meter, get measured, and then come back through this wire and go back into the circuit. So I put the meter in series so that I can measure the current. Yeah? It doesn't matter what size you put in there. Right. It, you can do it on either side of the resistor. It doesn't matter. Um, so that's how you can measure the current through one resistor. And then when you're all done, you just disconnect from your resistor, you pull your jumper wire out of your board, and you plug your resistor back into the board. Okay. Um, and then you're back to having the circuit the way you started. Of course, you need to have the power supply connected to your circuit when you're measuring the current, because the power supply is what supplies the current. You can do a similar thing to measure the total current for your circuit. Okay? If you wanted to measure the total current, that would be the current flowing through one of these jumper wires, right? So if I wanted to do that, I could just pull this jumper wire out, plug my meter jumper wire in where it came from, and then hook my other end of my meter onto that jumper wire. Again, with the power supply connected to, to these two leads. This would measure the current that was flowing into the power supply because that current would have to flow through my meter and get measured before it, it um, went to the rest of the circuit. Okay? And again, when you're done, you just disconnect your meter and put everything back to the way that it started. So that's how you can measure the total resistance, the voltages, and the currents for your entire circuit. Any questions about that? Uh, I have a question about the emitter. Yeah. Like, uh, what, we, what would you recommend that we have in our house? Um, uh, well, so you are allowed to bring one page of notes front and back, eight and a half by 11. Um, one thing that would probably be helpful is the color codes, um, because, like I said, you're going you're going to be doing a translation from values to colors. Um, other than that, it's up to you. You can have any any notes that help you um, or that that sort of guide you in the right direction. Um, it, it's really up to you beyond that. Okay. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. 
Do we use the rounding portion of values or the real values? You're, you're going to use the real actual values. So when we, when we do like a check, when we check it off, like, uh, so we should pay for just checking it. What, what do you mean using a separate piece of paper? I mean, like, to check out the answer. Oh, oh, yeah. So, if you're doing the calculations to check your work, I would recommend that you, you do as little rounding as possible. The more rounding you do, the, the more errors you introduce, right? If you had a value that was, you know, 5.25 and you, you round it to just 5, then you multiply it by a few things and you do some more rounding. You're, you're creating small changes each time that you do that. Um, and the more times you do that, the farther you get from the correct answer. So if you do that enough, your calculated answer might start to look different than the, the measured value, even though you did the correct series of, of calculations. Um, so I would recommend keeping the as many decimal points as, as you can, probably two or two or three decimal points during your calculations. Was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, can you use index cards instead of no you're allowed to have one sheet of paper uh, front and back. It can be up to eight and a half by eleven. Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Um, if, as long as it's less than 100 square inches. Okay. So if you wanted to have one index card, that would be fine if you wanted to have um, a piece of paper. Well, I say that because some people have um, you know, note cards printed out that are in, in funny shapes. You know, they're sort of long rectangles and stuff like that. So it's, it's OK to have a rectangle like this big. Not OK to have one that's like this big, right? Um, so, um, so as long you can you can have handwritten notes, you can have printed notes, um, you could have them in you know uh, any language you like. You can have them in any sort of um, shape that you like, as long as it's less than 100 square inches, uh, and it's just one sheet of paper. Okay? Yeah. Earl made up these uh, you know sheets of this song just to go out. Yeah. Some yeah, people have. Simple. Yes. Yeah. That is. Printed, it's one sheet of paper and it's less than 100 square inches, so that qualifies. Is that one? Uh, the, this one I got handed out in uh, 312. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, um, so those are okay. Some people have little cards that have the, the color codes printed on them, and that's okay as well. But if you bring in the card, that's your one piece of paper, all right? So you can't have a card and other notes, it's one or the other. Yeah. So is this pretty much the what we're going to be doing? Is there going to be a bunch of things on the midterm? This is it. The only difference is that it's not going to say practice at the top, and it might be a different color sheet. But other than that, it's going to be the same. So, so let's talk about a few more details, OK? Um, any, any questions about building the circuit or doing the measurements before we go on? Yeah. So it's the uh, G, section D, G. Yeah. Unless it's five, five, and five, six, eight. Yeah. So exactly. Okay. So that's a good point. Let's let's talk about the last part of this test. It says list materials and test equipment that you use to perform experiments. There's six blank boxes or six blank lines. So you want to fill in six pieces of um, test equipment. Okay. So yeah. So let's let's throw out a couple of uh, examples. Who can think of? Um, some materials or test equipment that you might have used. Function generator. Uh, well, we use the function generator in the lab, but but not in this test in particular. D power. Yeah, power supply, DMM, <coughs> resistors, absolutely. Breadboard. Breadboard, sure. Jumper wires. Jumper wires. Yeah. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a piece of equipment there is. Yeah, there you go. What about? What about these wires? What are these called? Leads. Leads, yeah. Um, the alligator clips are at the end. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, jumper wires, yep. Uh, jumper cables are the ones you use on the car, so a uh, little different. But. Make sure those clips don't Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so those are all good. Um, what about for doing your calculations? Calculator. Calculator. Yeah. Um, other, other uh, test equipment. Yeah. It's kind of implied now, but calculator is allowed on the exam. Yes. Yes. So you are allowed to bring a calculator, and you can use that on the test. In fact, I highly recommend that you bring a calculator to use. You are not allowed to use a computer or the internet. And um, because of that, you're not allowed to use your phones. The phones easily connect to the internet, so we don't allow any phones on the test. Even if you have a calculator app on your phone and you, you really like to use that, we, we just don't allow the phones because there's just too much of a temptation to, to be able to go on the internet. So this is why it's very important to have a calculator, um, a standalone calculator, not a phone, for the test. Yeah. Uh, so I think we listed enough uh, materials to, to fill in these boxes. Anybody have questions about that? All right, so then let's talk about a few more details for the, the test itself. Um, the test is going to be in the lab where we normally have our labs. So we're just going to meet over there. We're not going to come to this room first. We're just going to meet over there. Um, we'll meet at our normal 9 o'clock starting time. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, some people, we, we don't have enough benches in our normal lab to have everybody at their own station over there. So we will have some overflow into the room next door. So you'll just uh, talk with your lab partner and decide who's going to stay in our, our typical lab room and who's going to go next door. There's the same equipment in both places. Um, it's it works just the same. It's just up to you. Yeah. You will be allowed to have an hour and a half to do the test, but there won't be a penalty if you go over that time. So it, it's technically an hour and a half long test. Okay. Um, like I said, you're allowed to bring a calculator. You're allowed to bring one page of notes front and back. Uh, other than that, it's closed book, closed notes, closed computer. Um, let's see. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. No, no, there won't be a lab afterwards. Um, there, you. When you're done, you can just go home, go to your next class, go wherever. Um, yeah. So. Today, we're not going to have a specific lab either. Okay, We're not going to go over there and, and do something out of the lab book. We're going to have an open class period. So what I would recommend is that um, you use the time to either practice for the midterm or finish up on your communicators if you still have a few things left to do there. Okay, If you do practice for the midterm, which is a very good idea, I would recommend building the circuit, doing the measurements, and then having me or one of the other uh, helpers come over and check your work, okay? Because sometimes you think you built it all right, you, you think you've practiced it just perfectly, and, and unfortunately there's a little bit of a mistake in what you're, you're doing. And we would be happy to come over and talk to you and either give you the thumbs up or give you some pointers today, right? We're happy to answer as many questions as you can think of today. When it comes to the day of the actual test, we are very limited in the number of questions that we can answer. We can, we can answer questions that are strictly about clarifying the instructions on the test, but anything beyond that, we, we can't really help you out. We cannot tell you if you've built the circuit right. We cannot tell you if the measurement looks right. Uh, we cannot tell you if the calculations are, are done in the correct order. Um, so. Ask us those questions today. We'd be happy to answer those questions today. We can't do it on the day of the test. Okay? Um, so, any questions before we head over there? Okay, then I will take roll and then I'll let you go.